Welcome to Hear Me Out. I'm Celeste Headley. We're approaching the third anniversary of George Floyd's death at the hands of Minneapolis police. That tragedy and the protest movement that ensued in its wake rocked the nation and the world in ways that are still very much palpable today. Across the nation, police reform was talked about seriously, and in many places that happened for the first time. And reforms did happen in some places and for at least a short period of time, but none of that has been enough to end police brutality. So it's worth asking, is anything enough? Or are we dealing with a system that's just too broken to fix? Often the police don't do anything to resolve the questions that you call them for, and yet we are taught that the police are the only people we can call. They're the only solution to this problem, even when we know that they don't solve it. Writer and organizer Gio Mar joins us to make the case for abolishing police in just a moment. Stay with us. Wireless data. It's what connects us to just about everything. And full power license spectrum is how it gets from point A to point B. Americans will use five times more 5G data by 2027. To make sure all Americans benefit from secure, reliable 5G networks, we need more full power license spectrum. Go to more5gspectrum.com to learn more. Welcome back to Hear Me Out. I'm Celeste Headley. In some ways, it feels like forever ago now, but around this time three years ago, the nation was on edge and it was about to be even more so. It was the early days of the pandemic and there was still so much that we didn't know about the virus or how it spread. But on May 25th, 2020, there was another inflection point. A man named George Floyd was murdered during an arrest attempt by the Minneapolis Police Department. We will not play audio of that arrest, but most likely it's seared into your brain as it is into mine. George Floyd pleading with the officer whose knee is bearing down on his neck for nearly nine minutes, calling for his mother. Protests spread like wildfire across the country in the days after that. And by mid-June, more than 2,000 cities had seen massive protests. More than 200 had imposed curfews to try to tamp down on the unrest. 30 states had deployed the National Guard. Property was destroyed. It's really hard to forget. It is easy to forget, though, that those protests created some change. In the year after George Floyd's murder... At least 17 states imposed bans or restrictions on the use of chokeholds or neck restraints by police. And yet, in spite of those reforms, people are still dying in police custody. Tyree Nichols' death in Memphis has been the most high profile, perhaps, but there have been others. The Washington Post estimates that 1,082 people have been shot and killed by police in this country over the past year. The database Mapping Police Violence, which is run by an activist group called Campaign Zero, estimates that police have killed at least 300 people in the U.S. this year. As these numbers demonstrate, it's hard to tell the true scope of this problem. So is the solution accountability? Is it defunding, reducing funding? Maybe something even more radical. Our guest today argues that nothing can fix policing in America. Activist and educator Gio Mar says the system is too broken, so much so that the only solution is to get rid of policing entirely. That's absolutely what I mean. You know, I think the institution of the police on a worldwide basis is so embedded within uh, the policing of capitalist inequality, colonial and racial inequality and divisions, that there's really no rebuilding the police as an institution in a way that is more amenable to social justice or racial equality in this country, particularly with the legacies that we're dealing with. But, you know, we, we can talk about the fact that we, we need something, we need an alternative, uh, we need that something to be strong enough to keep us safe, right, to keep our communities safe and, and to keep our our neighbors and friends and loved ones safe. That's very different from the police, right? When we're talking about people keeping each other safe, we're talking about organic community security and looking out for each other, all things that we know, that we understand, that we intuitively, I think, know, and that we practice all the time when we don't call the police. These are the kind of things we need to be thinking about. But as far as the institution goes, there's really no salvaging it. We're going to get into who would do all the things the police do in a moment, but let's start with why you say there's no salvaging it. Do you really believe that every single police officer is a bad apple? 
No, and I mean, if we're talking about uh, institutional questions, the answers are institutional. We need to think in terms of what the institution does to people, right? The job that it expects of them and that it requires them to perform. This is not something that can either be asked or answered on the institutional level. I mean, I don't have a specific opinion on, on people's uncle or brother who may happen to be police officers, but when they're sent out there in uniform, they're sent out to perform a job. And one of the real virtues of the sort of, uh, you know, movements in the streets, whether it's BLM or the, the sort of rebellions in 2020 after the, the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, was that it was really, uh, you know, one of the first times that in a systematic way, people started to look at the institution as an institution and to say, these reforms are not working. These individualization is not working where we say there are good apples and there are bad apples. The whole barrel is, is rotten, as the parable goes. And we need to begin to think on an institutional level in terms of responses. Here's the thing, though. If my house is robbed... I'm going to want the police there. I want them looking for who robbed my house. And in fact, I hear complaints all the time that the police aren't doing enough, right? Like they're not going to, the police officer will tell you, look, we don't have the time to, to track down burglars because we're doing all this other stuff. Like there are, are real things I really want the police to be doing. In a funny way, like the answer is in the question, right? The police didn't stop your house from being robbed. Um, often, and I've had this experience, the police don't do anything to get your belongings back. They don't do anything to um, resolve the questions that you call them for. And yet, I think in some ways, quite rightly, we are taught that the police are the only people we can call, right? They're the only solution to this problem, even when we know that they don't solve it. And so I think that starts to point us um, in some ways in, in, in the right direction, right? Why is it that policing, as exists, does not prevent this kind of crime? Why is it that it doesn't uh, respond to it well? Why is it that even the things that policing claims to do, sort of investigation, arrests, prosecutions, first of all, very rarely happen, if we're looking in the grand scheme of things, um, but, you know, more importantly, don't prevent the kind of harm that we're trying to overcome, right? They don't prevent burglary. They don't prevent violence in communities. If anything, uh, you know, when we understand it on a macro level, we see violence corresponding to policing in a lot of ways. There's a sort of right-wing talking point about uh, Chicago as being this sort of lawless place. This is one of the most policed cities in the country, right? This is a place just dripping with police. And yet, we know the kind of social violence that persists because of what? Because of inequalities, because of uh, segregation, um, because of a lack of opportunity, because of a lack of other um, funding into other programs that would be able to help deal with these questions. We're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, Gio and I will discuss how the average American feels about police and what they do. This is Hear Me Out, a podcast from Slate. Stay with us. China is making 370% more 5G spectrum available than America. Tell Congress to restore FCC auction authority and allocate more 5G spectrum to make sure America leads the industries and innovations of the future. Go to more5gspectrum.com to learn more. Hi, I'm Dahlia Lithwick, legal correspondent, author, and host of Slate's Amicus Podcast. It's a show about the rule of law, the law, and the Supreme Court justices who interpret it for the rest of us. I wanted to give you a heads up about an exciting upcoming live event that we're doing on Wednesday, May 24th. Mark Joseph Stern and I will be live in D.C. to talk about the end of the court term and how we should be covering it as journalists. We are putting together an amazing roster of special guests. And for those who'd like to go all out on the event, there's going to be a happy hour before where you can meet me and Mark and some of our colleagues from Slate. Get more information at slate.com slash live. Would love to see you there. And Slate Plus members, you'll get a special discount on tickets. You can find member event discount codes by signing into Slate and visiting your account. We're back on Hear Me Out. I'm Celeste Headley. Let's return to my conversation with Gio Mar. We're discussing whether or not the average person would be okay with abolishing the police. We have all these stories of police walking beats and getting to know people in a neighborhood and helping to find children who go missing, helping when someone has been injured. Police often, even though their ability to deter crime 
is up to question. On highways, at least, people do slow down when they see a police car, right? They're, I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to dig into the, the limits of we don't need police to do the things that they're doing. It's That's hard for me to wrap my mind around because it does seem like there's things police do that are, are really important and sometimes based in a community and its own needs. It's very interesting. Again, it's interesting to hear uh, almost the way that the question sort of poses the answer when you flip it around, right? I mean, there's no reason that the police would be those given to sort of help find a lost child or um, to help someone who's injured. We have first responders. They do that very well. We hear stories about police doing that in the news, and and, uh, often we hear those stories because they're exceptional, right? Because they're not the sort of everyday function of the police. And they're being presented to us in a way that upholds and justifies and legitimizes an institution that's not there to, you know, to keep people safe, strictly speaking. And, you know, um, we've got, again, we've got, you know, many other institutions that do that. The question really is, what would it take to think about those institutions differently? What would it take to think about the things that we do need in society and to think about what institutions could be, you know, built in the place of police to to perform those functions? Of course, one of the great examples that's, uh, you know, thankfully becoming more and more prevalent in, in conversations and in policy circles has to do with mental health, right? And we talk about the police keeping people safe. We know that when police are introduced into a mental health crisis, um, violence is very often the case. Um, people with undergoing mental health crises are something like 16 times more likely to be, able to be killed by the police than, 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 than others. Um, and yet family members members often will call the police because they don't know what else to do, right? Because they don't have someone else to call. And this is this is the essence of the question, right? Who else is there to call? Which is why cities have been saying, listen, police, armed professionals who uh, bring violence into situations are not the, pe- the people to call for mental health crises. And that's an incredible insight that luckily, again, is, is being taken seriously. Um, but it's the kind of insight that we need to bring to a lot of situations. Why call someone with a gun if your child is missing, right? Why call someone with a gun if someone has been physically harmed and needs medical attention, right? You call a doctor, right? Or you call neighbors or you call others who are better equipped to, in an organic way, um, respond to these questions. And, and, and the other you know, piece I think is very important about what you said, which is, picturing best case scenarios where police are so embedded within communities. um, Ultimately, that's the goal, right? But the goal is for it not to be police doing that, right? Um, And when you asked at the beginning, as sort of just trying to test the limits of where, you know, where police abolition goes, I think, and and this may be a sort of controversial for police abolitionists, at a certain point when the community is taking care of itself, that's not the police anymore, right? It's not a specialized, armed group of people from outside the community, it's community members working together. It's community members making decisions on their own about how to stay safe. But something happens when these are uh, sort of organizations outside of the community that come in and police them. And specifically, when we're talking about the kind of policing that's done, um, you know, by professional police, which is so often about wealth, so often about protecting people's property, the property of the rich in particular, and so often about protecting racial privilege and upholding racial segregation. So then you've got people coming in from far outside of the community, right? You've got people coming in who, who don't represent or reflect or even identify with the community and who more often than not see that community as inherently violent, inherently dangerous, and as something to be sort of patrolled um, and controlled in a certain kind of way. More often than not, that's what the police are sent out there to do, which is why we know that you know, many reforms don't work, which is why we know that um, diversification of the police doesn't work if, if it were not clear enough, you know, from events in, in Memphis recently, right? Um, you could have all of the black and brown cops in the world, but if they are being sent out to do the same job um, that is to uphold sort of wealth and white supremacy, they're going to do the same kind of work um, that's expected of them. But in order to do what you're talking about, each one of those different individual portions has to be Uh, made the responsibility of another entity, right? If someone else is going to be looking for lost children, who's going to be doing that? And how do we hold them accountable? We have to create, I assume, a new system for early warnings, for getting notifications out. Those are things police do now. You know, I interviewed a number of people, say, here in the Metropolitan Police in D.C., and they've become actually very good at tracking down kids who go missing. That's one thing that I think you can point to as a big success uh, on a regular basis for at least some 
police forces. Aren't you talking about creating a massive sort of bureaucracy? I mean, these things are bureaucratic and, and we have a tendency to view them as bureaucratic. But I mean, we also know that a lot of times when people go missing, when children go missing, communities mobilize, communities, uh, you know, engage with other communities. Um, the media plays a role and these things are dealt with in a certain way. None of that is to say that these kind of warning systems should be uh, should also be abolished. But but again, I don't think these are necessarily police institutions, right? These are institutions that can be repurposed, that already exist, and that can be put into the hands of, you know, of, of communities. And that can be, you know, understood in different ways. And the same could be said of so many things that we sort of naturally associate with the police, right? Investigating forensics, these kinds of things. Um, there's a reason that these things are, you know, exist within subdivisions of, of police entities, because they aren't necessarily police functions, right? They are, you know, functions that have to do with, um, you know, trying to figure out things that have happened, trying to think about, um, you know, prevention in these kind of ways. Um, and we've got many, many elements of, of police departments soaking up resources that could be better done by other entities. But again, ultimately, we're also talking about people having um, people that they can call, right? Having stronger um, community ties, having community organizations. You know, again, there are so many examples and so many experiments that are being developed that do work, that we know work, right? These sort of uh, what are called violence interrupters, people that um, operate within communities on a community level who are not armed, right? Who are not police and who actually are very effective at preventing violence before it happens, right? At defusing conflict, at giving communities and neighbors someone they can call, someone they can bring in, and some of them can have conversations, um, different forms of mediation. All of that is in, in some ways a Band-Aid because we're talking about communities very often that are extremely poor in which lack of opportunity is, is sort of the, you know, the, the catchphrase, uh, lack of jobs, um, and in which there are long histories of, you know, of violence that need to be dealt with and, and uprooted. And so, it, you know, unfortunately, when you're talking about this being a large sort of task, it ultimately is, right? We get the, the police that we have today in the United States, for example, from the long history that grew out of the failures of Reconstruction after the Civil War. And I bring up that long history to say that Reconstruction is, is ultimately what needs to be done if we're talking about abolition, right? If we're talking about dismantling an institution, we're also talking about building up an alternative, also talking about building a different kind of society that, to use the phrase that's so often used by uh, someone like Angela Davis, in which police are obsolete, right? And what does that mean? It means that um, we, we need to build a kind of society in which police don't make sense, in which police are not the first or only response that we have. And yet in the world of policing that we live in, a world that's been built around the institution of policing, uh, we're, we're taught and in, in, in many ways it's, it's true that the police are the only option that we have to call. We need to create more options. Okay, we're going to take a very quick break here. Um, we're talking about whether or not the police should exist as police not be reformed but abolished and we're speaking with Gio Mar who is an organizer an activist a writer and we will be back to speak with him in just a moment this is hear me out from slate I'm Celeste Headley stay with us from an Iraq war cover-up to towns ravaged by opioids to the roots of our modern immigration crisis embedded explores what's been sealed off and undisclosed NPR's original investigative podcast reveals why these stories and the people behind them matter. Listen to the Embedded Podcast, only from NPR. I'm Dahlia Lithwick, host of Amicus, Slate's podcast about the courts and the law. Trump's entire defense was, was based not only on Eugene being a liar, but pretty much on every other person who testified in that courtroom also being a liar. This week, history-making lawyer Robbie Kaplan and the only woman ever to hold Donald J. Trump to account in a court of law, E. Jean Carroll, join me on the show. I didn't think there would be a grade above what I was experiencing with Robbie as we gripped hands in the courtroom. We go deep on their groundbreaking case, their victory, how it all came together, how they plan to respond to the former president's evident desire to keep paying defamation damages forever into the future. Robbie has figured it out. Oh, good. Robbie oh, really? has figured That's it nice out. That's nice Tell me what I figured out. You figured out legal recourse to Donald Trump's lives. Amicus with me, Dahlia Lithwick, every Saturday through June. That's A-M-I-C-U-S. Find us wherever you listen to your podcasts. 
Welcome back to Hear Me Out. We are speaking today with Gio Marr, who is an organizer, activist, and writer. And his opinion that he is articulating today is that the police are beyond help. As an institution, they can't be reformed. They need to be abolished. Here's the thing, though, Gio. And and maybe this is just a product of the fact that I've spent more than 25 years as a journalist. And I'm perhaps more suspicious than other people. But I will say... Although most people are are basically good and are not trying to harm other people, that's not true of everyone. Um, we just had somebody driving down the street at 9.30 at night, smashed into one of my neighbor's cars and just drove off. We cannot rely on communities and people to do the right thing. And in many ways, that's the reason that police forces were kind of first created by Robert Peel in London, right, was to create this group of people who were not the military who could respond unarmed to these kind of incidents. How could we possibly trust all of our neighbors, everyone in our community to do the right thing? I think that's a great way to put the question, right? Because it, it really forces us to recognize that there is no such thing. And I think we really need to come to terms with the fact there's no such thing as perfect safety. There's no such thing as perfect security. We don't know that everyone in our community or in the country certainly is always going to be behaving in a way that is supportive of other members of society, right? Or, or won't do harm to them. But that's a reality. And that's something we need to understand. We actually don't know. And this is really one of the uh, most troubling things about the system of sort of hyper policing and mass, uh, you know, incarceration that we have today, we don't know, you know, how many people in, you know, in prisons across the country, how many of the more than a million at this point and up to two million in the past um, were sort of, you know, unable to, to be reached or, you know, you know, be treated through sort of various kinds of mental health treatment or given counseling. We have no idea, right? Um, and so we hear, instead we hear these sort of extreme stories or people talk about serial killers or talk about other sort of absolutely evil individuals. This is the most minuscule fragment of the people who make up the, you know, the, the incarcerated population, the people that are policed every day, right, that are sort of just, you know, harassed by the structure of policing. Um, and, you know, people think about the founding of, uh, you know, the, of policing in the, in the metropolitan model and in Robert Peel. Um, but we need to remember, of course, that in the U.S. context, um, at least half of the sort of early origins of policing comes as well from slave patrols. It comes from the over-policing of um, black people who had been enslaved and were uh, were enslaved, and that the London model is built on colonial policing in Ireland as well. It, it was in many ways an adaptation of military colonial occupation to the streets of London um, to police populations that were understood to be problem populations, right? Um, it wasn't necessarily about keeping the peace or providing safety, but about and very much built on a preoccupation with dangerous people, right? And dangerous people can mean um, poor people, it can mean sex workers, it can mean, you know, black people, brown people, Irish people. Um, and this is built into the history of policing. You really find it almost everywhere, this, this policing of populations. And uh, you know, again, the dual principles of policing, past and present, have been to uphold wealth and to uphold whiteness in a certain sense. It's very difficult to, to move beyond that. Um, but it is absolutely true that we need to think about what it would mean to, uh, again, build these alternatives, create situations in which real safety can be, um, you know, can be developed. Um, it's very difficult to do when you're spending trillions of dollars nationwide on policing, right? When you actually don't know what a world would look like where you really funded social programs. We know perfectly well, even comparatively, that the United States spends so much less on sort of social welfare programs than even European counterparts. You know, I would love to see police that walk around unarmed, honestly. Um, that doesn't mean I would stop to, you know, cease to have a problem with policing. But, um, you know, going to a situation like had historically existed in the UK obviously would be a step forward. Um, but, you know, of course, that requires funding social programs in a different way. That requires upholding a certain level of basic social equality. Um, and it requires in the U.S. context dealing in a serious way with the legacies of slavery white supremacy and existing and ongoing um, economic and social inequality. Okay, I want to jump in here really quick. You've, you've, you've talked about a lot of things that I want to make sure we're keeping everybody with us. So I want to explain a few things that you talked about. Um, first of all, you talked about Sir Robert Peel. He, in the first third of the 19th century, say 1820s, established what was known then as the New Police. He also, as you mentioned, developed what was the Irish Peace 
Preservation Force. And pardon me if I'm getting any of these not quite correct. But Robert Peel designed both of these forces as an alternative to the military. But you're you're right. In Ireland, at least, they ended up a proto-military force. They preemptively put down uprisings among, especially among the average working people against their British landlords. But in London, at least, it worked better, right? That uniform that we think of was intended to be more friendly. It wasn't a a military uniform. It was a friendly blue (laughs) with white buttons instead of the red coats. He instructed all of those police officers to use restraint, to use persuasion rather than weaponry. And in the end, the Metropolitan Police in London, at least, um, were accepted by citizens because they did things that were useful, Um, They were night watchmen. They were walking the beats so that if a woman was walking alone at night, she could feel at least that a bobby was within calling. And they did not end up threatening or hopefully in most cases intimidating. Now, you also talked about when it got here, the police force here was very tightly wound up with the history of slave patrols and also, frankly, with the protection of rich people's property. That's all true as well. But I say all this historical stuff to ask if we were to recreate many of the jobs that um, police are now doing, if we were to say, okay, get rid of the American police institution, it can't be reformed. Now, let's figure out how to dole out all of these tasks that they may have been doing. Isn't it possible that we would be recreating something similar to what Robert Peel did in the 19th century? That's a good question. And as I said, right, I, I, I think I take these questions as seriously as possible in terms of, the you know, being very real about the fact that we need to keep each other safe, right? We need to keep communities safe. Um, I think that, you know, that could rub people the wrong way if they say, well, aren't you just recreating the police, right? Um, but again, I think there's a qualitative distinction that that says that if communities are involved in playing a role in organically keeping themselves safe, this is very, very different from the police. That doesn't mean that there's no overlap between the two. We have examples like, uh, you know, what we could understand is like neighborhood watch, where community members are keeping an eye out for each other. But ultimately, this often exists in wealthier communities. And what they do when they see people that seem out of place, which often means poorer people, people of color, is that they call the police, right? I mean, this is a sort of para-police organization. It's certainly not uh, what we're aiming for. Um, The ultimate goal is to understand that, you know, in many cases, communities are uh, more likely to treat each other as valuable, right? If there's someone causing problem, you know, a problem in the neighborhood or causing harm in the neighborhood, the police are not going to recognize that person as necessarily valuable to that neighborhood. But that's someone's nephew, um, that's someone's son, grandson, that's someone who may be an essential part of that community. And communities are at the very least more likely to understand that person as someone who can be reintegrated within that community. Um, The idea, of course, is to transform the way that that reintegration works, right? And, And again, like, thankfully, we've got all of these new experiments on how to do that, right? Like less carceral experiments, and sort of rehabilitation and reinsertion of people and reintegration into communities, um, restorative justice that involves allowing people to come face to face with the harm that they are causing and to be sort of counseled and supported in becoming a, a, you know, a better and more active member of that community. All of that, though, takes place on a backdrop of uh, not really having dealt with structural questions, right? Again, poverty, lack of opportunity, lack of housing, lack of education and after school activities. And so in the absence of that, we're going to have disruptions. We're going to have harm being done, right? And and so we also need to be engaged in this broader project of building a more egalitarian society. Thankfully, you know, uh, you know, strategies like defunding the police are playing both of these pieces at once, right? Which is to say, what would happen if we took not even all of the police budget right away, just a good chunk of it, right? And dedicate that to not only violence prevention, which we do know works, which has a track record of working, um, whereas we have not seen violence reduced, for example, where I live in Philadelphia by increasing and ever-increasing and ballooning police budgets. Um, what would happen if we dedicated those resources to uh, to violence prevention? But also what would happen if we dedicated those resources toward building a sort of more sustainable and egalitarian city, right, in which, um, you know, young people have opportunities, in which there's not as much of a temptation or an impetus to, to engage in violence or theft or other kinds of disruptions. But sometimes when we talk about allowing communities to decide some of these issues, sometimes the police have to step in to protect one community member from another community member. And look, we've seen this quite 
upsettingly in recent years where uh, mobs of people can become dangerous and entire communities can decide to, I hate to quote an old Western, but take the law into their own hands, right? And endanger another member of their community. They can react in a knee-jerk way. They can decide to mete out justice on their own. Don't we need to have someone who is out there on a regular basis protecting people from, I guess, the, the 21st century version of frontier justice? Sure. And certainly and when we need organizations and we need institutions and, and all these things are necessary. But it's all we also need to understand that the really the most destructive and prevalent and persistent forms of that justice are sort of white supremacists, you know, the lynch mobs, right, are the kinds of sort of uh, neo lynch mobs that killed Ahmad Arbery, right? Like this is means getting to the same. We're not asking a different question. We're actually asking the same question, right, which is how to deal with the legacies and the persistent legacies of inequality, of white supremacy, and the ways that they play out in uh, in the present. And again, they don't come from different sources. They come from the same course, the same source. Of course, we're not talking about mob rule. We're talking about, you know, deliberate conversation, intervention. We're not talking about a lack of institutions. We're talking about new, different kinds of institutions, ideally on the sort of neighborhood level. But of course, you know, we've got, again, we've got different variants of these. We've got uh, in Philadelphia, institutions that allow people to uh, engage in community service and engage in community conversations and counseling instead of going to prison to uh, understand, again, to understand the harm that they've done. This is happening with youth offenders across the country in, in these small experiments that hopefully will become larger and broader experiments. And again, that's all very, very hard and very slow work, but it's work that we know pays off in the long run. And it's the kind of thing we need to be expanding. Is there any argument from the other side that you think is valid. Have you heard a police supporter say something that made you think, yeah, that's that's actually pretty fair? <laughs> Not very often, but, uh, you know, the one that I always come back to, right, is that I think you will ask, if you ask a lot of cops, right, and, and again, not people that I will often agree with on much of anything, if you ask a lot of cops, they would agree that they're being put onto the streets to deal with problems that, that were not created by the police, right? Or broader social problems, problems, they'll, as they would put it, created by politicians, like we're being put out there as, and, and this, becomes very quickly the logic of the sort of thin blue line, you know, to protect people from themselves. But I think you would get, a, you would find a lot of cops who, who say this truth, right? Which is to say the social structure is creating this violence um, and they're being thrown out there in a very desperate way to, you know, prevent it insofar as possible, right? That doesn't mean they're going to put their, their jobs on the line to sort of rethink that social structure, right? And it doesn't mean for the most part they're going to treat those communities, uh, you know, with the respect and dignity that they deserve. And when you see the cops that do try to do that, or the cops that, for example, you know, reveal what's been going on, um, in police forces, the kind of violence and indignity that has been inflicted on those communities, they get blacklisted, they get fired, they get pushed out often, right? Um, those are the, the sort of good cops that we often refer to are the ones that end up being fired, that end up being, uh, you know, prevented from actually engaging in this work um, because of the sort of logic of blue silence. Gio Mar, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a great conversation. Okay, so as with so many of these conversations that I have, Gio gave me a lot to think about, a lot that I hadn't really considered before. I don't think the idea of just getting rid of police entirely ever occupied any space in my brain before this, and I'm going to have to give it some thought. I can't say I agree with that idea or support it at this point. But it's hard because I've never even considered it seriously. I wonder if you have or what ideas you've come up with when you think about this issue. I do want to thank Jill Marr once again for joining us. This, like so many of the things we talk about, is a controversial issue. And I know people have strong emotions. And we really want to know what you think. We know you probably have an opinion. So email us at hearmeout at slate.com. And let us know your thoughts. We've been getting lots of emails from listeners, and we are so grateful for all of your thoughts. Please keep them coming. We want to share this note we received from a listener named Scott about last week's episode. We had Cindy Gallup on to discuss diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings, and she argued that they're hogwash and don't help. Scott wrote this in response. While I agree with the guest that much DEI training is window dressing and ultimately ineffective, 
The solutions presented focused almost exclusively on gender inclusion. I would have been interested in hearing more about how to increase representation among other underrepresented groups. The question posed at the outset encompassed a broad swath of underrepresented groups, but narrowed quickly to a discussion and example that seemed very focused on a single group. Perhaps this topic can be revisited to explore other ways forward. And I agree with you, Scott. I got to say that there is more research on the effectiveness of sexual harassment training and gender inclusion training than pretty much any other group. Racial inclusion is starting to catch up, but there is still a lot to talk about here. I agree with you. It is worth revisiting. We love hearing from Scott and we love hearing from all of our listeners. And again, our email address is hearmeout at slate.com. Hear Me Out is a podcast from Slate. The show is produced by Maura Curry. Ben Richmond is the Senior Director of Podcast Operations. And Alicia Montgomery is VP of Slate Audio. I'm your host, Celeste Headley. So until next time, speak your mind, but keep it open. <laughs>